Uh, thanks for that introduction. That was very nice. Uh, uh, about eight years ago, I did, in fact, have a, uh, a, a pain in my left side that my physician thought was a running injury. Uh, but I went to uh, an orthopedist to have it checked out, and he felt around and said, you know, just let's get a quick MRI and make sure that there's nothing else going on in there. So I got the MRI, and lo and behold, it turned out that I had a mass in my abdomen. It's called a, a re in the retroperitoneal region, which for those of you who don't speak medicine means it was like inside my hip, between my hip bone and my pelvis. It's a very difficult place to get to for a surgeon. Uh, and it was big. It was the size of a baseball, and uh, I needed to get to a cancer hospital ASAP and get this thing taken out. Uh, this was a shock. Uh, at the time, my children were uh, a year and a half old and four, uh, and this was not the kind of information that you want to learn about when you're a young parent. Uh, so I went up to the hospital, and uh, as, as I was in my scrubs getting ready to go in for surgery, uh, some researchers came by with clipboards, and they said, do you mind if we just ask you a few questions uh, about your chem what they said, your chemical exposure? And I said, well, I don't know if I can help you. I really i have only been a journalist and a professor. I've never worked at a uh, despite the fact that I live in Delaware, I've never worked at DuPont uh, or any of the other companies, so what could I possibly have been exposed to? And they said, no, we're not interested in industrial chemicals. We're interested in the things that you come across every day, like if we were sitting in this room, you know, the, the stain-resistant chemicals that are in the carpeting or the acoustic tiles or the formaldehyde that is in the plywood that, you know, buildings are wrapped in or your, the cosmetics that you've been exposed to or you know, the stuff in your drinking water, the stuff that's on your lawn, all that kind of stuff. And I said, well, yes, I guess I've been exposed to that because who hasn't? They brought me in for surgery. Uh, I woke up a few hours later and my wife and the surgeon were smiling at the foot of my bed and they said, congratulations, it's a boy. No, they said, congratulations, it's benign. Uh, they didn't expect that. Uh, I said, well, what do you mean benign? I thought we were all ready for this big malignancy. They said, well, we see 100 of these tumors a year and 96 of them are malignant. So lucky me, uh, there I was with a big scar on my belly and, and a lot of questions about what, what all this meant. So I did spend some time uh, trying to revisit the questions that those researchers had asked me uh, pre-op, and this book is the result. Actually, these two books that I'm going to be talking about uh, are the result. Uh, for those of you who are interested, some of you may have been at the, at the talk earlier today. Um, I'm currently writing a book about GMOs. It's funny that GMOs is starting to get some real currency now all of a sudden. For me, my, I, I enter the GMO question from this position of uh, inquiry about pesticides, chemical uh, pesticides. So anyway, we can talk about that later. So anyway, this, this is a funny title for this talk. This title is called From DDT is Good for Me to Fracking for the Cure. How an English professor learned the difference between polybrominated diphenyl ethers and neonicotinoid pesticides, became attentive to the ironies of language, and began taking his students canoeing. <laughs> so one book is called What's Gotten Into Us. Uh, I apologize that there are so few copies out there. Uh, this book is in hardcover. It's coming out in paperback uh, next year and is probably, weirdly, going to have a different title. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why, but... Uh, the word, well, I don't want to get into this, but the word gotten turns out to be, I think, of German extraction, and people wanted to call it what's got into us, which is like the English version of this title. And there was a lot of confusion. And Anyway, it's going to have a new title, so you might have to look for it under another name. Uh, then, more recently, just in April, the paperback of this book, Poison Spring, has come out, which I co-wrote with a guy who worked at the EPA for 25 years, and that's kind of an insider's look at how a lot of things get approved and what is going on between these industries that we've been hearing so much about and the actual regulators that are theoretically keeping an eye on things. And it's quite revealing in that regard. So I'm just going to tell you a few stories about this. So in 1912, a famous ship goes down in the Atlantic Ocean. Why was it so unusual? There was no plastic on that boat. Now, that may seem self-evident or funny or obvious to you, but that was 1912, and uh, 30 years later, we hit World War II and the industrial explosion that accompanied it, and the plastic century that we now live in essentially was born. So I just want you to think about this. Is really only 100 years ago, uh, there were no plastics anywhere. When the, uh, the um, marine uh, um, archaeologists dug that boat out, they found all kinds of things on there, glass and lead and silver and brass and bronze, but they found no plastic. So just think about what happened in the years since then. 
So, as you probably know, and you may have even heard today or in the last few days, a lot of the chemicals that we're talking about uh, were invented, many of them for, for, war, for purposes of warfare, but petrochemicals of all kinds were developed in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, 20 years after this, thanks to Rachel Carson, uh, the world kind of woke up to this stuff called DDT. Uh, I don't know how many, I'm sure you all read this book in high school. It's worth revisiting. Uh, really one of the most important books of the 20th century. DDT up to that point had been marketed as a miracle spray. Right? You, could, you can look up photographs of DDT being sprayed on people in a pool. Uh, you know, uh, many of you may even have your own personal memories of walking down your neighborhood streets and being fogged by the DDT truck. Right on people's heads. Right? What could possibly be wrong? This stuff all it does is kill bugs. Right? That was the idea. DDT was marketed as a miracle cure and sprayed all over neighborhoods. You could buy this in any hardware store. So Silent Spring comes out, and suddenly the world is uh, made aware of ecological webs. Now, we can talk about this during Q&A, but it's not like Rachel Carson invented this idea. Uh, but she brought this into the popular imagination that you spray something on bugs, it rains, the stuff goes into the water, goes down into a creek, goes down into a river, fish get contaminated with it, birds eat the fish, people eat the fish, and this stuff, it's called bioaccumulation, right? So the stuff that starts out small, starts to get into little fish, but a big fish eats a lot of little fish, then a bird eats the big fish, or a person eats the big fish, and you're getting multiple um, uh, inputs from the same chemical. So if you're at the top of the food chain, you're getting a lot more than you would if you were just a little fish. Now, I don't know if you know about Rachel Carson's story, but her, her Silent Spring first came out in the New Yorker magazine. It was serialized in the New Yorker, then became a book. And as soon as it came out, the chemical industry did everything it could to uh, uh, destroy her reputation. If you read the attacks that it made on her personally, it's really quite uh, impressive. What a lot of people don't know, and this didn't really come to the, our awareness until her biographers told us about it, is that Rachel Carson was dying of breast cancer even as that book was being written. Uh, and yet, she never talked about it. Uh, she never um, used that to defend, you know, in any way to kind of elicit sympathy from people. All she did was publish the book, which, by the way, won every major literary prize there was, and just then had to withstand the attacks of the chemical industry uh, as she was dying. Uh, so then we go back to sleep. That was, you know, in the early 60s, and it's been pretty much downhill since then. If you think about what we briefly were talking about in the early 60s, how much of our public conversation has been about any of this stuff since? Here are a few reasons why this is true. This, by the way, is also the root of the GMO question, uh, so we can talk about that, too. So, uh, you know, with all these soldiers returning, I mean, this, this, the post-war housing thing is actually one of the most important things in American history, I think. Because after the war, all these soldiers came back, and they no longer wanted to live in the cities. We built the interstate highway system, which you probably know was built to model after Germany's Autobahn. Like, the idea was to build this highway system so we could defend ourselves. If after this, uh, this cataclysm of World War II, we wanted to make sure that our country would be uh, defendable. So you build these highways, which suddenly means that people can commute. They can get in their cars and commute to the city. They don't have to live in the city to work in the city. They can live in the, somewhere else and drive into the city. So once you build the highways, then you can build a lot of little roads, and you can start building subdivisions. Now, I'm sure it's true here in Florida. It's certainly true where I'm from. Subdivisions that look a lot like this are absolutely everywhere. So what did those houses get built on top of? They got built on top of farms. What had once been farmland was now, you know, the joke in the 70s was what are farmers growing out there these days? They're growing houses, right? So just keep in your mind the GMO stuff you've been hearing about. If all these farms are being turned into subdivisions so that people can live there, so we can create suburbia, where is our food coming from? This is what we didn't really think about. Well, all our, all our farms are moving, we're migrating west. If we were on the East Coast, they were migrating. Well, California is its own thing, but all the farms that were in New England, were in the Mid Atlantic, were in the South, started to move towards the Midwest. In Maryland, I live in Baltimore. In Maryland, uh, in the last 40 years, one million acres have been developed. Now, here we were talking earlier about the, the use of language. Uh, to call building houses development means that it's a uniformly, or assumes that it's a uniformly good thing. We're developing the land, we're improving it, making it better. Uh, that comes at a cost, which we're only beginning to understand. 
So a million acres in 40 years, 873,000 acres of farms disappeared, 500,000 acres of forest disappeared. That's just in Maryland, okay? That's just Maryland. But yet it's just worth thinking about the trend, like all this stuff is happening. Farms are disappearing, suburbanization is happening, and for our purposes, there's a lot to talk about. So since the 1930s, right, pre-war, four million small farms have disappeared, turned into subdivisions bearing nostalgic if ironic names. Think about the names of subdivisions. and what the, the, the joke is that subdivisions are always named for the things that were destroyed to create them. Turning local farms into subdivisions meant tectonic changes, both in the scale of our material wants and in the way we eat. So you think about it, you've got all these giant houses out there. Now you've got to fill them up, right? People used to live in little places, little apartments. Now we live in big houses and increasingly bigger houses like Levittown, you know, Levittown, Long Island, Levittown, New Jersey, those are little houses. Now everybody lives in big houses, and they're filling them up and filling them up and filling them up. So we create giant big box stores to provide everything we could possibly want. Fill our houses with stuff, we fill our bellies with industrial food coming from the Midwest. So consumerism, which everyone talks about, right, there's a structural reason that consumerism happened, because it could happen. We could suddenly move stuff around on the big roads, we had lots of houses, we had lots of uh, shopping malls. And companies were very happy to satisfy our every desire. So here, this is how these chemical companies grew into companies that provide the raw materials to create consumer products. So right now, chemical companies are producing materials to create 70,000 products. Now, 70,000 may seem to you like a little number. But think about, for example, you know, like plastic cups. How many plastic, this would be one of 70,000 products. How many of these are there in the world? Millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of them. How many plastic water bottles are there? Billions of water bottles. How many square acres of carpeting is there? How many gallons of paint? How many gallons of pesticides and lawn fertilizers and you name all those things. Each one of those 70,000 is magnified uh, to a very large degree. Chemical company, $637 billion, right? Now, this is where some of their economic clout and along with it, their political clout, where it comes from. So we create these suburbs, we create these products, and we start buying them and using them like crazy, but we didn't really stop to test them to see whether they were, uh, you know, benign, whether they were, um, would have any negative impacts on our bodies or on the environment. So as you probably know, a great majority of our convenient everyday products are made with petrochemicals. Almost none of them are adequately regulated, which means we don't really know what they're made out of or if they affect our bodies. Now here's a number. I'm not going to use a lot of numbers today, but there are a couple you should know. How many chemicals are in use today? Roughly 80,000. How many have been adequately tested for their impacts on health? 200. This is what it looks like. You've probably heard about these things called body burden studies. The CDC and some local groups are starting to look in, I mean, not particularly well funded, I might, I should say, but they're starting to do things like test people's bodies for the presence of these chemicals. So it turns out that if you take samples of your blood and your hair and your urine and put them through the proper laboratory procedures, you can find out that your body at this very moment has bisph bisphenol A in it, or it has phthalates in it. Or it has, if you're using certain kinds of nail polish removers, it might have toluene in it. It might have xylene in it. It might have atrazine, a pesticide. It might even have DDT in your body. Probably there is DDT in your body because there's still DDT that you can actually swab off your windowsill. Even though DDT has been illegal for 40 years, it doesn't disappear. See, one of the great, you know, you, you grew up hearing when people were trying to convince you to recycle, they would say things like, you know, that plastic bottle is never gonna, it's never going to decompose. Well, that actually is, tr is more or less true, but it's also true of the constituents of it. So even if it does decompose, it's not like the, p the petrochemicals de decompose. There they are, right? You can, people, if you, if you, you'll read stories about this in the paper every now and then, they'll do a local study where someone will swab windowsills in town and start telling you what's in the air, what's just kind of blown around out there. It's very interesting. Okay, one more number. Uh, every year, the United States makes or imports 27 trillion, that is a T there, 27 trillion pounds of petrochemicals. So if you think about it, if you had a train or a, a truck caravan, uh, each truck capable of carrying 8,000 gallons, this caravan would go from San Francisco to Washington, D.C. and back again. 
So, you know, some of that stuff goes into your car, some goes into your lawnmower, some of it goes to make pesticides or fertilizers, but a lot of it stuff goes to make lipstick, and it goes to make plastic bottles, and it, makes to, it goes to, uh, you know, make your carpeting. It goes to make all the things that we've been talking about. Now, one little side trip here. Um, one thing Americans seem to think is that our country has, has gotten environmentally a whole lot more enlightened because we don't have a lot of industrial pollution anymore. Now, the corollary to that, of course, is we have no jobs anymore either. Uh, so, you know, we, we sent all our industry overseas along with all the jobs that went with them. But if you follow the, the trail from the United States to China, you will find out that China, where all our stuff is being made, they have horrendous environmental and health problems that would be ours if we still made this stuff here. So when you buy cheap stuff made in China at a Walmart, one of the reasons it's cheap is because labor is cheap in China, but the other reason is that you know, there, are very few, I mean, there are very few environmental regulations in the United States, but there are fewer in China. So cheap goods has consequences although you may not be able to see them. The direct connection between cheap stuff at Walmart in the United States is a factory in China that is polluting a river in China, which may be causing health problems in China. Do you see what I mean? The global economy doesn't just mean cheap stuff. The global economy means environmental problems and health problems are also global. So those are just some things to think about. I was in China a couple of years ago, and uh, in Beijing, you can sit in the middle of the day and you can look directly at the sun. Try that here. I mean, our air is cleaner than China's, but we shouldn't be proud. I mean, we shouldn't necessarily feel great about that. Just that China's air is like dirty because we don't we make our stuff over there. But you can look straight at the sun. You can also like flying over Shanghai. You can look down and see the river over there on the right hand side there. Uh, that kind of chocolate water. You can see that from ten thousand feet. Like you can see the runoff uh, in these rivers from the, from airplanes. So, uh, you know, China makes everything, right? So a couple of year, for the last couple of years, uh, over the last couple of years, uh, some 20 million pieces of children's toys sold in the United States had to be recalled because they were found to have been painted with lead paint in Chinese factories. Now, lead paint has been banned in the United States for 40 years, but it's not banned in China. And, you know, you, talk, you hear stories about this, and, people, and the companies that make these things initially will say, well, you're not supposed to put a train in your mouth. So what's the problem? You know, maybe uh, chemical company executives have never had children, I don't know, or something. Uh, other things, I mean, I'm just going to give you the news headlines. You've heard many of these things, I'm sure, but products made with hard plastic, right? This is the old Nalgene bottle model. The Nalgene now is not bisphenol A, but um, they used to be made with bisphenol A. Uh, that chemical is a hormone disruptor. And you've probably heard about things like, uh, uh, you know, two public health things that you, you hear about are early onset puberty in, in, uh, in American girls. Girls are, are hitting adolescence earlier and earlier. And also among boys, you hear stories about low sperm counts. Both of these are hormonal imbalances that some people are thinking may be, in fact, uh, affected by these hormone-disrupting chemicals that we're surrounded with. Uh, flame retardants, this is where the polybrominated diphenyl ethers are, uh, are neurotoxic. They are found in everything, clothing, mattresses, upholstery, electronics. turns out that they accumulate in uh, breast milk and be passed on to children. Um, there is an interesting story. Uh, in Sweden, you know, Europe is way ahead of the United States in regulating this stuff, and Scandinavia is even further out. And in Sweden, when they found out about these flame retardants, they simply banned them. You know, Sweden, being very much interested in public health, says, oh, these things are, uh, you know, accumulating in breast tissue. Let's get rid of them. They got rid of them, and uh, within three years, the accumulation of these chemicals in women's breast tissue dropped by 30%. Wow. Um, so we hear that news, and we, you know, that's not the case in the United States because we haven't banned them. Uh, phthalates, the compounds that make plastic bottles soft. I see many of them around the room. Uh, there, as you take drinks out of those plastic water bottles, uh, you can actually test the migration of the plastic in the bottle into your body. Uh, they, they've done this many times. Uh, I mean, they've even done documentary films of people like drinking nothing but water out of plastic water bottles, and you test your urine, and there it is. There's the phthalates right from the bottle. I mean, the stuff 
is, uh, is quantifiable. And if you ever have warm liquid in a bottle, it leaches that much faster. So one thing to keep in mind is that, I mean, there are many reasons not to drink water out of plastic bottles. Primarily, it's incredibly expensive. It's more expensive than gasoline. Uh, you want the water, but you don't want the bottle, right? What you're, what you're buying for $1.69 a liter or whatever it is, is the water. You don't want the bottle. You just want the water. But what you're getting literally is the bottle because you're drinking the bottle as well as the water. And then, of course, you have this thing you have to throw away. And as you know, like a very tiny fraction of all plastic bottles are actually recycled. So now you're adding that into this system. So one recommendation I would say is do your best to wean yourself off of plastic water bottles. These same plastics, though, are also found in all kinds of soft plastic things like uh, you know, baby toys. Also, weirdly, they're in air fresheners. So if you, you're not necessarily going to see this on any labels, which is something we'll talk about, but you know, if you spray an air freshener, you're also spraying phthalates into your room. If you ever go into a, like a public restroom or an airport or something, and you see those um, air fresheners that are mounted, those like uh, motion-sensitive air, that's squirting, you know, hormone-disrupting chemicals into the air. And there's nothing you can do about that, right? You, you, you know, you got to go when you got to go, but there it is. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's just entering the atmosphere. So you'd like to try to avoid that stuff. Uh, the labeling thing is a real problem because, uh, as you know from the GMOs, uh, almost nothing is labeled. And the reason nothing is labeled is because companies want to keep it that way. They don't want you to have to think about what's, your, what's in your products. Some things are labeled. Like you will go into the hardware section of a, of a big box store and you might see things that will say, uh, warning, this product is known to cause cancer in California. And you say, well, good, I'm in Florida, no problem, you know. Uh, that's because California regulates stuff. They force you to put a label on it. And it's because these companies are making products for the national market, they stick that stuff with a good label on it in a place in Florida. But most products have no label on it, including especially cosmetics, which we'll talk about in a minute. But even if it has a label on a product in the hardware section, uh, you will find, if you're, if you're looking for it, you will find products in the cosmetics section that has the same chemical in it but no label because cosmetic companies have so far successfully managed to avoid any regulation about putting labels on their products. So this is literally the same chemical that goes into like a degreaser and goes into, a, uh, into personal care products. And you know, you might wonder what kind of enlightened regulatory system regulates products that go on your engine block but not products that go on your skin.